Okay, we're back, we're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is ThinkTech, and more specifically, it's ThinkTech Tech Talks, which we're going to talk a little tech today with our chief scientist, uh, Mike DeWork. In the past, we've talked about COVID, and he's had some charts and graphs, but it all led us to this kind of balancing and see what science had to say, a scientific approach to balancing public health with reopening. Um, this is a very valuable and interesting analysis. You will see what I mean. Welcome to the show, Mike. Nice to have you here. Aloha. It's good to be here, Jay. Thank you. So you found, uh, you looked at the data and you found some very interesting, surprising, if not counterintuitive data about the Great Depression. Can you talk about it? Yeah, it was, I was, I got a question at the end of last show. Um, would, it, would we kill more people with the lockdown than if we just let the disease run rampant? And we had, well, what other economic recessions can we look at? Well, it turns out the Great Depression is a good example. It's four years of really bad conditions, uh, conditions um, that until now we hadn't seen. And uh, there's some literature actually been done on it. Economists have studied this and uh, they found some very interesting, perhaps puzzling results. So if we go to the uh, first set of graphs, um, here's a paper uh, called entitled Life and Death During the Great Depression. And what they found was that uh, during the four years of the depression, 30 to 1930, 1933, mortality rates actually went down. And this is just one fourth of the data they present in the paper. They, they went every five years from infancy to very old age and looked at death rates. And I've highlighted in red the Great Depression and the recession of 38. And it turns out that for all age groups, the death rates in the Great Depression went down compared to the roaring 20s, the boom right before. And it tended to flatten out in the boom right after, and then go down again in the recession of 38. So that's uh, showing that people don't, fewer people die during the Great, Great Depression than died during the economic booms before and after. Do you have a and, theory on why? Is there any indication, any kind of comparable data or factors that can explain this? Yeah, and, well, this applies not just to the Great Depression, but to economic recessions in general in rich countries. There's this well-known huge literature in the economy, econ economics literature about fewer deaths during depressions. Every, for every 1% increase in unemployment during a recession, the death rate goes down four tenths of a percent, which is a pretty big effect. And um, suicides go up a little bit, but all other causes go down, including liver disease, influenza, pneumonia. You'd expect that people would stay home. They're not getting exposed to get the flu or pneumonia. So, okay, they won't die of that. There's fewer accidents because there's fewer people on the road. There's fewer industrial accidents because there's fewer people at work. Construction workers aren't getting crushed by equipment and stuff, things like that. So uh, liver disease is a little bit of a puzzle um, that, that's clearly in the data, but lower liver disease. Um, maybe people just can't afford drinking. I don't know. Uh, but there's a lot of reasons why staying home would reduce mortality and it reduces infant mortality as well. Uh, maybe people are able to stay home support the mother while she's pregnant, uh, keep an eye on the infants and kids when the mother has to sleep or is busy. Um, so there's just, people are home together. They're not out getting exposed to things, not out getting, putting at risk from accidents. Um, there's a lot of reasons. And the only, the only cause of death that went up during the Great Depression was suicide. And it went, did not go up nearly enough to compensate for all the decreases mm. in the other. So there's uh, no place like home. No place like right when they said that. I think there was a song also. Okay, oh, yeah. so you have another chart uh, that, yeah. that is uh, with a similar result. Can you talk about that? Yeah, the next slide it shows. So say, so maybe people didn't die as much during the Great Depression, but maybe they got stressed out and they didn't live as long afterwards. Well, so on the next slide, I show from the same paper, they show uh, life expectancy at birth. Since the 1930s, we've had enough time for enough people to die that we know what the median life expectancy was for all those years during the 1930s. And uh, if you go to the next slide, um, oh, I don't see it on the screen, that's okay. So life expectancy at birth actually went up during the- We're period. looking at, uh, okay, this is slide number two, right, yeah. Right, so during the Great Depression, life expectancy at birth actually went up. And it's uh, amazing, it's not a subtle effect. It went up quite a bit. Um, let's see. Um, and, and it was, so the roaring 20s, economic expansion, you see this kind of up and down, up and down, but now life expectancy during the Great Depression, steady up. Um, so the, the, the more unemployment, the longer longevity of the people that were born in that era. 
and then it went back down again in the boom after the depression. Then it goes up during the recession of 38 and the lead in the slowdown right before the recession of 38. So, and so life expectancy at birth wasn't harmed either. So people, fewer people were dying and they were living longer, the ones that were born in that era. Can you explain the difference between life expectancy and mortality? It's not the same, not the same concept, and the numbers right. are, you know, they come from a different place. Well, mortality is how many people die here. So, hundred thousand people might die this year, but maybe the ones that are left behind are stronger and will live longer because of that. You could, you could maybe make that hypothesis. So, life expectancy birth is how long you expect to live if you're born in 1930, as opposed to how many people died in 1930 which because those people could have been old people that were going to die anyway. And now you've got, you know, some change that's made you able to live longer than your than the rest of the people that were living already at the time. So Sorry. mortality happens to people already living. Life expectancy of birth is what's going to happen. To people so so now, now it's a different um, set of factors because mortality, um, you know, means you lost your life somehow, whether from disease or accident or what have you. But expectancy means that you're, as you said, you're stronger, you're, you're more resilient in your whole life, and you're going to live a longer time because somehow being born in this period uh, made you stronger. Can, right. can you give me some, some detail on that? I mean, how would that work? How would I be stronger because I was well, born in the 30s? For example, if during the 30s, your mom was home, your dad was home, your grandma and grandpa were home, all taking care of each other, watching mom, making sure she doesn't work too hard, doesn't put stress on her body. And then when you're born, you're a little infant, you have more family at home watching. That's a hypothesis. I don't know how to test it yet. Economists mm -hmm. probably have tried to figure it out. But when you're little and there's more adults around to watch you because they're unemployed, then maybe you gain an advantage in terms of your vigor as a young person. You get a little bit stronger earlier, and then it should keep getting stronger later. Of course, the other things that have been going on since the 1930s is tuberculosis rates have gone down. They were going down then. There's still, you know, um, other things went down, but smoking went up. So, um, but despite that, the people born in the 30s live longer than the people born in the 20s and people born right after the Great Depression. Um, and if you look at the next slide, it's, there's this really interesting effect on minorities. Minorities gained the most in life expectancy during the Great Depression. So, um, uh, are you looking at the next slide yet? Yeah, we are. And uh, what is a minority exactly for the purpose of this ex analysis? I think this paper is anybody who's not white. Mm -hmm. Okay. So white people during the Great Depression gained about four years of life expectancy, both men and women, during 30 to 33. Non-whites gained seven years of life expectancy. They closed the gap in longevity. During the Roaring Twenties, there was a big gap it was narrowed during the Great Depression, then it widened again during the economic expansion afterwards. Then it narrowed again during the, um, during the recession of 38. So it's, it's, un, it's very clear in the data that full employment, a booming economy is hardest on life lifespans of minorities because they're doing the toughest jobs maybe, they're exposed to more risk factors, um, you know, they're like they're the caregivers have to go into the nursing homes and be exposed to the sick people or um, they're, the, they're the bus drivers that are exposed to sick people all day, those kinds of things. Um, so, and maybe and, it's and just stress. Yeah. Now this is mortality, not expectancy, right? This is life expectancy. But, oh, this is life expectancy. Yeah, so but we, I'm just, yeah, life okay. expectancy for minorities versus for whites from the, from the paper uh, the same paper as the previous two slides. Mm -hmm. So people born in the 30s, minority people born in the, during the Great Depression gained seven years of life expectancy uh, compared to what they had before. Uh, minor, white people born in the Great Depression gained four years of life expectancy. So those people, you know, live longer than if they'd been born in the roaring 20s or in economics after the Great, Great Depression. So that, that goes back to the analysis we talked about before is that um, during, during that period, if you're going to have a longer life expectancy, your life experience in that period would have made you more robust, more yeah. resilient, um, a stronger person uh, in order to survive longer. That's very interesting. 
It's interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah and uh, so I don't know if there was enough data for the war years and the economic uh, depression that came right after World War II yet, uh, but other depressions they've studied. And in the last slide, I show the results of a different set of studies for the whole Office of Economic, the uh, organization, OECD countries, the economically developed countries. And um, for those 23 countries, which are all rich countries, um, you see the same trends through multiple recessions in the second half of the 21st, 20th century. Multiple recessions, the, if the unemployment rate goes up 1%, death rate goes down 4 tenths of a percent. It's an astonishing correlation that the more the economy booms, the more people die. And that's just, um, that's the data. So it says to me is uh, easing the lockdown, being in a hurry to ease the lockdown will cost more lives than it saves. That we can go, we should go slow on the easing up the lockdown and do it in a way that makes as much sense as possible the most sensible thing would be for us to wait till there's a vaccine or an effective curative treatment because um, then we don't have to incur the risk of people getting sick with COVID-19 as well as the other risks that they're going to face just in their jobs and the stressors of working you know in hard jobs. Um, so how do we I, th this is a problem that we set ourselves and it's a policy problem go ahead. I mean I just think that's a, that's a fantastic analysis and a fantastic result but it's um, very credible to say that if you have an economic um, recession or depression now it, it effectively emulates what happened in the 30s it falls right into that those charts you showed us yeah and, and yeah. so you have you have three factors i mean three results one mm -hmm. is mortality would be less um in in a depression uh, or a serious recession i think we're going to have a depression myself um, two is uh, expectancy is going to be longer, mm -hmm. and three is the disparity between whites and non-whites will be less. It's, it's like everybody wins here <laughs> by virtue like by, by virtue of a depression. So therefore, you know, uh, let's continue the lockdown. But what you know, I mean, does anything militate against those conclusions? Well, you could say the conditions are different now, although in the second half of the 20th century, all those recessions they studied with the OECD countries, um, they doesn't seem to show a change in the second half of the 21st century, 20th century rather. So um, I, I, I can say that I don't think there's a big change, except maybe socially, maybe we are a less cohesive country than we were in the 30s. I don't know, there was a lot of fighting in the 30s. I mean, we had neo-Nazis, we had actual Nazi Nazis, you know, marching in the streets of the United States, wanting to support Germany and its horrible things that Hitler was doing at the time. Um, so I think, I wouldn't say that our social fragmentation is that much worse than it was in the 30s. Um, we, we have demagogues here, like we had Father Coughlin and Huey Long back then, um, fragmenting the country. So I think that I don't, think the, I don't think there's any reason to expect it to be different this time. Mm. You, know, but, but you know, one thing that strikes me is uh, bigger families in those days. Yeah, maybe. And, and the families, um, you know, maybe multiple generations in the families. One generation takes care of another. Um, they're very physically close. Uh, they share uh, in the food. They share in the, you know, in the daily life. They, sh they help each other. And it's that support mechanism that happened in a large, that used to happen more often in a large family that may, that may be an operative factor here. Now we have small families, we have the nuclear family, or we have one person living alone. Um, and the lockdown really uh, doesn't allow, doesn't allow for a large family group to support itself. On the other hand, we are seeing millennials, young people staying at home with their parents a little longer. Um, we might be seeing a return to those kinds of cohesive families because right now during the lockdown, if you want to be out in a group of people, you have to live together to be not run afoul of the law in certain states, uh, certain cities. So if you live with somebody, then you can be out with them and that, that works. Um, and if you live with somebody and you interact with them, you're less likely to go out and catch the disease somewhere else. Um, so, yeah. Well, I, I, 
it could be a good, good, good things could come of uh, a few years of lockdown. So, so speaking in terms of public policy, this conclusion, um, you know, when you test it, it sounds, it sounds pretty reasonable to me, uh, is that uh, if, we could, if we could continue the lockdown or um, some version of the lockdown, we would, it would probably, it would probably uh, in, increase um, your life expectancy and reduce mortality and reduce disparity. Um, that's kind of an amazing result, but then that makes it pretty attractive to continue the lockdown. Um, well, as we provide the support that people will need, some people just will need support during the lockdown. And Congress did a good job with the stimulus payments. Um, well, if the lockdown continues and the economy stays in the tank or goes worse in the tank, which might happen, um, that's, that's got to have a negative effect on all these charts, no? Well, with the Great Depression, four years, four years of economic depression. You know, the day we have a vaccine that's proven to be safe and effective, you'll see a boom like you've never seen before. Yeah, right. All the limitations would be gone. And, you know, I suppose if you had a boom, <coughs> such as a boom you've never seen before, you'll have more mortality, yeah. lower yeah. life expectancy, and greater disparity. It's not necessarily a win-win-win. Yeah, we need to consider this an opportunity to head those consequences off or minimize the chance of those consequences. Um, the danger I see is people just getting impatient. They want to make money. They want to go out and sell their homes, move, whatever. They want to have an economy. And, and the danger with the impatience is that if you open the economy too quickly, you will take casualties. We are in a war with this virus. You know, in New Zealand, they have a 1.3% mortality rate from this virus. Why? We have a 2.6% mortality rate. If we can get it down to the New Zealand rate, and then we get a million people have the disease to achieve herd, immor herd immunity before there's a vaccine. If you're impatient to achieve herd immunity before there's a vaccine, you've got to infect a million people in Hawaii. That means it'll take 13,000 deaths. It'll cost us 13,000 lives and much more disability to achieve herd immunity. And the, the policymakers have to say is, how fast do we want to get there? Are we want to take all those casualties in one year or can we spread it over years? And in Hawaii, we can't take all those casualties in a year without collapsing the healthcare system. We only have 800 beds for COVID-19 patients. We can tolerate maybe 600 cases a day if, if the people that are too sick to not be in the hospital or in the hospital for 11 days each. We can tolerate 600 new cases a day and we'll take two deaths a day and it'll take us four and a half years. So, that will take political courage for the politicians to come and say, yes, we're going to take casualties. Here is what we expect. We're gonna to try to reopen the economy at a rate that will only cost 600 cases a day and two deaths a day. You can you imagine a politician saying that? We're going to accept two dead people a day from this disease for the next four and a half years. And yet you can't imagine a politician say we're gonna leave the economy locked down for four and a half years until there's a vaccine. Either position takes political courage. But well, what, maybe the answer is in the middle, but it, I think, you know, the, the one point that is really uh, important here is that, is that if you continue the lockdown, you reduce the number of deaths by virtue of the disease. Yes, yes. So, yeah. so you have greater, you know, uh, life expectancy, less mortality, less disparity, and also you're knocking down the number of people dying from the disease. Right. That's, a, that's a pretty powerful position, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a pretty good argument for, you know, waiting for the vaccine or waiting for the effective treatments. Because yeah. also not waiting is to let the disease run rampant and going through cycles of uh, boom, lockdown, boom, lockdown, boom, lockdown. Which we really right. right, that's probably, yeah. So, uh, okay, so we can learn, we can extract from this, uh, this analysis and what happened before, um, some lessons uh, mm. about, you know, stress in your life and family and, and uh, you know, the, uh, the risks of, of, of working or some mm. kinds of jobs anyway. Um, mm. And I suppose it, it leaves us with the opportunity, Mike, you and me, uh, to speculate on, on a better world going forward. If we were the policymakers driving off this discussion, um, we would want to create a better world where people lived longer, where right. they had less mortality, where there was less disparity between the races, 
and um, you know, and less less immediate disease. Um, how would how would we do that? How would we, in order to achieve this, we would have to make sure that all those factors that helped in the depression were mm -hmm. present. We'd have to create a new world where we were sure that those factors would help on all of these fronts. How, yeah. what kind of, how would that world look? Uh, well, you know, like we had the Works Progress Administration in the 30s, where we put people to work who are unemployed. So artists got subsidies, construction workers got to build things. We built some of our best bridges and dams and, you know, public works projects in the 30s. We, we need desperately to reinvigorate our infrastructure in the United States. We should be investing in that. We should be providing those jobs, rebuilding our bridges, rebuilding our dams. We should provide the jobs for the healthcare workers. We have a healthcare system that is a capitalist, just-in-time system. It barely meets the needs uh, to handle the cases they have now. There's no surge capacity. We need to build surge capacity in the healthcare system. We could, you know, provide better jobs for nurses, doctors, med techs, those people as well. We could be supporting those kinds of jobs and providing better pay for those people. I mean, when you got a home health care worker who's going to be facing sick people every day and she's getting $13 an hour in Hawaii, oh, that is just wrong. You know, that's just wrong. Mm -hmm. And we need to find a way to support those kinds of things that bring up the dignity of the working people and make us feel like we're in this together as a society, trying to work for a better future for everyone everyone, not just the top 1% or one-tenth of a percent. Yeah, so what I hear you saying is uh, we have to change our way of looking at things, you know. Yeah. I remember it was about traffic. It was in the mm, 60s or the 70s, and uh, everybody was talking about making a four-day work week here. Mm -hmm. And the purpose was not about stress and strain. It was rather about uh, keeping the cars off the roads because the traffic was getting oppressive. Um, but you could do that. You could say, look, you know, we're going to have a, you know, the unions would like this, I think. We're going to have a four-day work week. We're going to let you spend more time at home where we know it's safer for you, uh, where you will have less mortality, higher expectancy, and less disparity. Um, we're going to make it possible for you to stay at home. And we're also going to have this idea about let's not race for the magic buck here. Let's find um, you know, a moral way to organize ourselves so mm -hmm. we don't stress out every day. Right. Am, am I on the right track with that? I think you're on the right track, and I'm not quite sure what it will take in terms of public policy. Uh, Health care for all would help. I mean, you, they, mm -hmm. you have a job tied to your health insurance yeah. just to be your stress. You know, people who might be in jobs that they're just badly suited for, they don't dare quit because they'll lose their health insurance. There are people who might want to start companies and you know be entrepreneurs they can't take the risk of uh, not having health insurance or having to pay an exorbitant amount for health insurance because they're entrepreneurs um so that's the kind of that's a start the other thing is um better support for child care you know we're you know we have a country now where we need two incomes to support a family in most most cities um certainly in honolulu and in, in honolulu two incomes isn't even enough I mean, I know families that are working three full-time jobs between the two parents. Um, it, one job should be enough. One, you know, one job should be enough. Two jobs certainly should be enough. And this is, um, so we need to find a way to, to raise wages. Um, and we need to, I guess, have a more equitable tax system. Back in the 30s, the marginal tax rates on high incomes were much higher than they are now. In the post-war era, during the recession after World War II, Marginal rates were like 60, 70 percent. Yeah. You know, on the very highest incomes. Um, we've just eroded and eroded and eroded that distribution. You know, the people who have made the most of this economy, of this society, had the greatest obligation, you know, to support the fellow humans because they didn't get there alone. They didn't build the roads, they didn't build the skyscrapers, you know, they didn't build the universities. They, but they have been able to profit from it all in terms of they had a better education, their workers can get to their offices, et cetera. Um, we, we have a chance to rethink this whole thing. Now, I'm not a sociologist. Sociology is far harder than physics. It's far harder <laughs> than that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I just noticed. 
So, no, but there are, there are these two, the two disciplines have to intersect. And yeah. I, what I hear you saying is, um, you know, it's, it's not just healthcare, it's yeah. uh, the social safety net. It's making somebody feel that um, there's somebody out there going to take care of him or her. Um, they don't have to worry about uh, horrible things happening to you, either medically or, or socially or economically. Um, and they have some of that in Europe, I think, um, you know, because yeah. of socialized medicine. Um, and uh, I think there are guaranteed in places in Europe. Have guaranteed. Andrew Yang, remember him? Uh, ran for president, $1,000 a month for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. There was, there was a, a, a magic in that. And maybe yeah. that fits in this whole discussion, doesn't it? Universal basic income, maybe, maybe. And when I say it's hard, physics is hard, well, the physicists are trying to help. Physicists have done a lot of work with network theory, trying to understand how clusters of together and, hello? You keep anyway. going, yeah. So with network theory. So in network theory, let you say if a signal starts say in this case a COVID-19 case starts in one place how does it spread through the whole network and there's been a recent study you might have seen it in science science news that a group of physicists studied COVID-19 and they came up with a model society and they said that the optimal cluster size for limiting the transmission of disease is 23 20, gatherings of 23 people and I said well it's probably specific to the society you're in and 23 is the magic number, but there is a magic number, and it's going to be different for Hawaii than for other places. For example, here in Hawaii, uh, we know we probably can't safely have the Honolulu Marathon. There's just too many people from too many parts of the world here coming into our state. But maybe we could safely do the Molokai to Oahu canoe race. Um, but then we have to look at the clusters. So, so you have a cluster of people participating in this event. How many of them are also active in their church? How many of them are active in the Bula Halals? How many of them are active in businesses? And how do those clusters interact? How does the disease transmit from a canoe race meet to your local church and then to maybe a business? Um, understanding those dynamics is society specific. And it's a big data problem, a hard big data problem. Um, I mean, if, I hope somebody in the state's epidemiology office is working on it. This is huge literature on now if they're willing to if they need help i'll be glad to try to help them out uh, but yeah yeah it's a, it's a hard problem it's a big data problem and it's a highly complex problem I mean, just if you say let's just do the whole million people in hawaii or a million people will have a million connections and so you're talking about a million million trillion possible data points you've got to track well, we're not going to do that but maybe we can track each individual business, how likely it is to do the connections, then set criteria for what we open at what rate we open so we can ramp up to the rate that the politicians determine is the appropriate casualty rate we can accept. You know? And it won't be zero casualties. I hope it's not the whole 13,000 people. I hope we get to you know, a vaccine before we have to incur that. See how, see how science can do more than just tell us uh you know, how the virus is contagious. I think we've been looking at ep epidemiology too narrowly. We have yeah. to look at, we have to look at science now, not only as a way to flatten the curve, <clears throat> not only as a way to, you know, develop medicines, but also as a way to um, reinvent our society so that it will be able to deal with other viruses later. Uh, right. And science, um, in conjunction right. with with sociology and uh, economics, you know, can actually find a better path for us, and that path would make a better life, a longer life, for all of us. And, and I think that's what that's what you've shown. And furthermore, if we reduce the amount of uh, of economic activity uh, and still be efficient, uh, would right. also reduce the effect on climate change. Yeah. Wow, what a yeah. win, 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 win. So and this. Uh, that, that, and but reducing those greenhouse gas emissions and those car, and those uh, sulfur emissions from fossil fuels will lengthen lives. It will lead to less death. It will lead less death in precisely the places where the poorest people live. People who live around oil refineries. People have to live in the coal fields. You know, all up and down the Mississippi River, all the energy industry infrastructure is famous for the amount of pollution they put out. If we can reduce that, we'll save the lives of those people. And if we give them jobs in green energy, all the better. Wow, Mike, this is really important stuff. This is the biggest opportunity 
it's it's being presented to us. It's painful, but we have to see it as an opportunity in which we can re reimagine uh, the human habitation of this planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank yeah. you so much for coming down. Really you. appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Thank Take you. care. Aloha. You too. Aloha.